Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the last lecture in the series that celebrates this exhibition, Burden of Proof, uh, National Identity and the Legacy of War. I'm very happy to end it um, with two of the artists who have come the farthest. <laughs> uh, Keisha Luce, who's from New Hampshire, just flew down yesterday, took the whole day, and Kirk Taragrasso, who came all the way from Maine to be down here where it's warm and toasty to give you this lecture. They spent almost four months in Vietnam, um, and they will tell you about the project. They've done other collaborations as well together, and I'm just really glad they made the trek. Thank Thanks you so both. Much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. So Kirk and I thought we would try to take you through the conception to the completion of our work in Vietnam exploring Asian Orange in the second and third generations of the Vietnamese people. I think most of you have already seen the Sun and Part series that we did, um, and also Kirk's photographs, which are in the next room. Tonight we want to introduce you further to the people who collaborated with us to make the sculptures through our words and also theirs. I recorded and transcribed oral histories after each molding session, and Kirk will be reading excerpts from those interviews. Also embedded in this story is my personal narrative as a child of a disabled Vietnam veteran who died of a service-connected cancer. And I just wanted to take a quick um, word about the physical making of the pieces. Each piece was created using Molding life molding techniques, which consists of applying a um, skin safe silicone directly to the body to create a negative mold. Then those negative molds were cast in four ton MG Vietnamese soil and fiberglass. And we do have a couple of images of just the casting process in general, just to show you how things go. Um, yeah, it's that. Uh, so this is the Plyo Life. Uh, it's a rubberized silicone material. It hardens in about four minutes, uh, so it's kind of tricky to work with. And how many pounds of it did we bring over there? Maybe? Uh, like 250? 250 pounds of it flew to Vietnam with us, so uh, it was kind of arduous task bringing it all around. But if you look at the next slide. Uh, this is the application process. Uh, you can see we were sort of in rustic areas sometimes, so we kind of had to fly by the seat of our pants. <clears throat> um, but this is uh, Keisha applying the Playa Life to low over there. Go to the next one. Uh, after the Playa Life is, is smeared on, uh, we use traditional medical casts to cover it uh, as a protective shell, also as, to keep the mold together. Uh, and then that's all sort of compacted and shipped back when we're done with the project. So these are this is the actual making of the negatives, and then the positives are made here, here in the States. So that's, yeah. Great. So here we go. 1961 to 1971. The United States used an estimated 12 to 19 million gallons of the herbicide Agent Orange to defoliate the landscape and contaminate food sources in Vietnam. The Agent Orange produced for the United States government contained high levels of dioxin, a carcinogenic and mutagenic chemical that has continued to alter the minds and bodies of generations of Vietnamese people and American veterans and their children. 1986. I am 10 and tracing the fleshy mound growing on my father's upper arm. In a few weeks, I will have a new vocabulary. Squamous cell carcinoma, Vietnam, Veterans Affairs, chemotherapy, radiation, Agent Orange. 1987. Under a full moon, my father's body left our home for the crematorium. The fire consumed the damaged flesh from the landmine that destroyed his right leg, the absence of his left, and the raging cells that metastasized throughout his body that still carried the war he fought decades before. He was 38 years old and leaving behind a wife and two small children. 2008. On a walk in my tiny northern New Hampshire town, while daydreaming about nothing in particular, a thought catapulted from nowhere, but arrived to me completely formed. I needed to travel to Vietnam to document the effects of Agent Orange through sculpture. I carried this daydream for months until I finally muddled and mumbled my way through explaining it to my friend and mentor, the late art historian Angela Rosenthal at Dartmouth College. In her customary matter-of-fact approach, she looked at me and said, you are a documentary sculptor. That does not exist, but you will become that. I left having a new framework, a new vocabulary as a guidepost as I move forward. 
Kirk and I have known each other since we were both undergraduates, and I have followed his stunning body of work while he was at the Salt Institute of Documentary Studies in Portland, Maine. He was the only other person who would take the bet that we could travel to Vietnam and complete the work, despite not knowing the language, not knowing if the government would allow us to proceed, and being told by almost all of the social workers, NGOs, and academics we came in contact with that it would be an impossible task. Uh, so while I was at SALT, uh, just at the very end of my time there, uh, I got a phone call from Keisha. <clears throat> uh, we also have a mutual, very good friend, Heather. Um, and Heather had been talking about Keisha's ideas to do this project. Uh, and she contacted me sort of out of the blue and asked if, explained everything out to me and asked if I would accompany her. And it, you know, I didn't even, it wasn't even a question. I was just sort of like, yeah, of course I will. Of course I'll go. Um, so we spent the next about half a year prepping for the project. Uh, and then flew out January 10th, I think it was, of 2009 to start. In the three months we spent in Vietnam, we traveled from the south, including Benoit, Ho Chi Minh City, Kuchi, to Da Nang in the middle of the country, and finally to Hanoi in the north. In some cases, we worked with NGOs in the open. Other times, we worked below the surface, introducing, getting introductions into the community under the radar of the government. We subsisted on charm, superstition, luck, and the generous spirit of some of me. We met hundreds of people, molded nine, and currently have six sculptures on exhibition. I'd like to introduce you to those six, and then turn the talk over to Kirk, who will speak more in general about the overall experience of our time in Vietnam. So we're going to start with Fong Tran. Fong is the tiniest person I have ever seen. When I measured him for the casting, he stood 72 centimeters high. He commands a classroom and has a presence in any room he enters. The time I spent with him resonated deeply, and when I think back to the making of this work, it is often the days in Da Nang with him I return to. Fong grew up in a rural poor village outside of Da Nang. In his early 20s, he did a remarkable thing. He moved to Ho Chi Minh City to attend trade school. Ho Chi Minh City is an unforgiving chaos of 12 million people. The traffic alone, considered the worst in Asia, is a daily intense battle, and I often felt overwhelmed. Fong negotiated the city for years. I think that is a testament to his perseverance and character. He found ways to adapt to not being able to step on a public bus, reach a light switch, or even the pay phones. After the completion of this program, he moved to Da Nang to teach at an Agent Orange Resource Center and pass along his knowledge. He also wanted to be closer to his parents as he felt his health was beginning to worsen. Fong was 28 years old when I interviewed him in early 2009. He is articulate and clear about what it means to be affected by Agent Orange and how this fits into a larger historical context, which is not the case for many who live in relative isolation and lack understanding surrounding these issues. At the end of my conversation when Fong with Bob about his experiences. Through a translator, I explained the idea for a sculpture series and the casting process. The interpreter smiled, and his reply is, you can do all of me. I want to be seen in America. Fong's house is best described as a garage. One large room with a concrete walls and floors, half of the room Fong used to fix motorbikes to make extra money. The other half held his bed, a small side table with a comb, a gold cross on a chain, and a television that got one snowy channel. The room smelled of gas and diesel from bikes. He sat on a stool in the middle of the room, and we passed around his small lamp as the sun went down, and we began to make his way around his body. I hesitated for the first time I touched his chest. Protruding from it was a bony mass. I looked up, and his eyes were closed. He spent much of the cast in time like that, except to occasionally answer questions of the crowd that gathered in his doorway to watch, and for me asking if he wanted a break, to which he always answered, no. Here are his words. Uh, so I'm speaking as Fong. <clears throat> uh, I will tell you what I know from the doctor's opinion. I got this from my father. Uh, he served in the Quang Bin and Quang Tree areas during the war. Doctors confirm that he is a victim of Agent Orange. Uh, when I was mature enough, my dad and his comrades often told me stories. When they were soldiers and marching through the forest, they picked up leaves and fruits from the forest to keep them alive. Uh, one day they entered a forest and saw that all the trees were dead. 
They had to keep moving for the next few days without food and water before they arrived at the next forest. My dad didn't know what had happened. Uh, when he came back from the war, my parents gave birth to me. He superstitiously thought that it was a retribution from his past life. Uh, when the second child was born with the disability, he began to wonder. My dad brought me to a lot of hospitals and was told by the doctors that it was the Agent Orange and it could not be cured. My dad is a bit relieved and felt less upset, but at the same time he blamed himself for causing this to his children because if he hadn't been in the war, he wouldn't have passed this on. I have fears. I am a human being who has hopes and dreams like any other. I do hope to have a family. However, I have to think about my future children. My future children might be affected as well. Scientists could tell me how many generations this Agent Orange will affect or if there's any cure to it at all. I will only think about a family if I know for sure my children are not affected like I was. Lloyd Nguyen. Lloyd Nguyen is striking for many reasons. He is very handsome and charismatic and hovers at five feet tall and walks on two severely disfigured legs. His right arm also tapers to a tiny ball of flesh with one fingernail. We met Loy by chance at Tudu Hospital. He had grown up there, but now in his early 20s, he lived with his extended family and works in the textile industry. He had stopped by his former residence to visit with some of his friends that still live in the wing. We exchanged phone numbers and later that week met for coffee. We ended up meeting Loy for coffee several times along with some of our Vietnamese translators that had, come, that had become friends with all of us. Even after, after several encounters, I was finding it difficult to get a sense of who Loy was. I asked a few of the translators if they could try to articulate his character to give me better insight. All of them answered in very similar ways. They said Loy was different from many Vietnamese, a rebel of sorts. He is fiercely independent and unafraid to voice his opinions even to those in opposition. I came to understand this better when I sat down to formally interview him. Loy's image from the time he was a small boy to a teenager appears in publicity materials for Asian Orange advocacy groups and was raised in one of the most famous Asian Orange centers. Yet, if asked, Loy denies he is a victim of Agent Orange. Loy does not want to be characterized as a victim. The majority of people I spoke with feel part of a larger community and identify themselves as such. Loy offers a different perspective. <clears throat> in Loy's words, since childhood, I have realized how different I am from others. At first, it was uneasy and embarrassing to have others scrutinize me every day, but then gradually I became used to it. I do not care how people perceive me anymore. I went to second and third grade in a school specifically for disabled people, so I didn't see any differences between my friends and me. But once I got to third grade and transferred to normal school, I started to experience the separation. I imagine myself having breakfast at a restaurant in the morning and reading the newspaper, and suddenly I see my photograph with the label Agent Orange on it. Everybody who was reading that newspaper would surely spot me and give me looks. Instead of the newspaper could read, Mr. Nguyen Hong Loi, though disabled, manages to live a happy life, it would be so much nicer than branding me an Agent Orange victim. I would lose my freedom of my image as others would see me different. Public perception about Agent Orange is overrated. That's why being a victim of Agent Orange is so much harsher. Once the truth is revealed, how will those victims be seen by others? And that's how I'm different from the others. The Dang family. We were introduced to the Dang family who live in a small rural community outside of Da Nang City by an Agent Orange advocacy group. They were instantly welcoming, offering fruit and tea during our first visit. I wanted to mold them to show the intergenerational effects of Agent Orange, and they agreed. Song Dang's father was exposed to Agent Orange as a soldier, soldier and died of cancer. Song, 46, was born with se severely deformed feet and very thin legs. His daughter, Hoya, was born with strikingly similar deformities of the feet. Both Song and Hoya are unable to walk without crutches. Song's upper body seems oddly misshapen, and I wondered if it was from the years of using makeshift, makeshift supports. I wondered if Hoya's body would twist over time as well. Hoya, who is 18 years old, lives a solitary life. Her poverty and condition prevent her from attending post-secondary school or interacting outside her home. The afternoon we worked with Hoya, a crowd of neighbors gathered to watch the mold making. Some watched for hours. The only place to work was on the lawn of dirt and dry leaves, and we moved across the land as the sun shifted, trying to find shade where we could. After Sun saw the process, I wondered if he would still be agreeable to let us come back the next day to mold him. He was. The following day, no one was able to help translate. 
After spending two days with the family and getting the sense of their good nature, we decided to go without a translator. Again, we spent the day mold making and trying to find shade under the broken canopy of the Dang's bamboo trees. We relied on thumbs up signals and songs, few English phrases that included no problem. The neighbors came out again, this time getting more adventurous and sticking their fingers into the mold making material. For lunch, we ate traditional faux noodles with the Dangs and their neighbors. It never quite seemed to matter. We only had a few words between us. Uh, these are Song's words. Our family has th three generations affected by Agent Orange. My father was the first. <clears throat> he was a soldier operating in the mountains region near Dai Lok area, where the Americans came spraying the chemicals. He was in the jungle. He said the chemicals were sprayed so extensively that it was unbearable for everyone. They had to retreat into the bushes and lie on their stomachs, their faces completely covered so they wouldn't inhale it. He also told me how at the same time the enemies came rushing from both sides of the Dialog jungles along the path famously known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They were very afraid and had to escape from the jungle. After a while they came back and saw a barren place as if there had been a big fire. Gradually his internal organs, especially the stomach, all dried up and shrank. He couldn't drink or eat properly and eventually my father died. I was born like this. I feel very little from my hip down. At first, I couldn't walk. After much practice, I learned to walk short distances. I think it was probably the war that infected my dad and that the poisons were passed on across generations. As a child, I was teased and called names like cripple and lame. They even played cruel pranks on me. When my mother went to work in the field, the others came and almost buried me alive in the irrigation channels. I felt as I was disabled and useless. I changed my mindset as I grew up, though. My daughter was born in 1994, and I immediately knew that it was hereditary. I knew it was the chemicals. Her older brother was affected too, but he did not survive. His legs were the same as ours, and he didn't have a mouth. He was very weak and just couldn't survive. I was very afraid. I was afraid that my subsequent children couldn't survive. My wife was extremely upset that her children are all born with the same illness. Lok Nguyen. I thought I had met everyone at the Agent Orange Center located about an hour outside of Ho Chi Minh City, until Lok Nguyen walked up one day and sat in the molding chair. The translator exchanged a few words with him, looked at me and said, he's ready. I typically have a conversation with people to explain the process and what to expect and to get a sense of where and how much of their bodies they wanted molded. Lok didn't require any of that. By then we had been working at the center for several days and word of what we were doing had spread. He held his hands as we got started. Lope was 16 years old at the time. He is handsome and about 5'5 in height, which is tall in Vietnam. Lope's hands and feet are deformed. He referred to them once as his dinosaur hands. I also noticed a small hairline fracture above his lip and suspected he might have had a cleft palate at birth. Despite his deformities, Lope is an active teenager. When, he had, when we took a break for lunch, he had me translate English rap lyrics for him. He joked around during the molding process and seemed to have many friends at the center. He did mention once when he was young he hated to be photographed. Lope grew up at the Tudu Hospital's Agent Orange Wing. His parents abandoned him at the hospital shortly after his birth. Tudu, located in the heart of Ho Chi Minh City, is a place frequently visited by researchers, photographers, and aid workers. Lope moved to the training center when he was 13 to learn trades so that someday he may be able to live independently in the community. He was somewhat quiet about his experiences, <coughs> but fascinated by the casting process. Uh, these are Lope's words. Since I was small, I have observed that people don't want to touch people like me. Uh, during recess, when other children were playing outside, we tended to stay in class. But we have grown accustomed to it. Everybody saw us as strange creatures and avoided us, but we are used to it. I'm different from people. I look like a two-hoofed dinosaur. When they took pictures in Tudu, I went some other place. I don't like it. Lots of my friends do not like having their pictures taken either. We are very ugly and very abnormal. Whenever I comb my hair, I can see the awkwardness of my hands and how they are different from normal hands. It also took me much more effort to do the same thing as other children. Back then in Tudu, there were kids with tiny legs that can't walk, and I think I was still lucky. <clears throat> Even so, missing a few fingers makes every task very taxing. Whenever I walk on a wet floor, I don't have enough toes to cling onto the ceramic floor. It's just too slippery. I just, have to, I just have the same number of fingers and toes just like every other person. 
I don't know much about the Agent Orange specifically. I watched war documentaries and saw the American planes spreading toxic chemicals. The movies show American planes spreading white stuff into the forest, and that's about all I know. I think if there weren't a war, there weren't Agent Orange, and we wouldn't have been this way. Even compensation wouldn't do us any good. I only wish to have normal limbs like other people, but it's only a wish. Nothing can fix it. Nyet Tran. Nyet was one of the first people I met at the Agent Orange Training Center. He attended most of the other molding sessions, watching and talking with us and the others who drifted in and out of the open air space where we worked. Nyet always seemed to be smiling and joking. The rest of the time he worked at the center's workshop making wooden decorations and trinkets the center sold to sustain itself. Nyet moved around on crutches. Without them, he hunched over and walked with the help from the tips of his fingers. His left leg was almost a reverse of his right. It curved like a crescent moon around the knee instead of the knee acting as a type of hinge. His back was also severely deformed with a large protruding shoulder blade. During the molding session, Kirk made the observation about the line of his body that extended from his back to his leg. It was like a mountain range of sharp peaks and low valleys. Almost everyone I interviewed cried, and I don't know why I expected Nyet to be an exception, except that he always seemed so happy, always. Most of the time, I worked with a translator, and it was sometimes difficult to gauge the direction and intensity of a conversation being so removed from the language. I didn't understand the intensity of our talk until he broke. I will always remember the sadness in his face, and yet seemed to be always happy, but there was nothing happy about any of this. Uh, these are notes words. <clears throat> I'm from Qinggang province. I lived here at the center for three months. I stopped going to school to help my parents work. Life is hard. I heard about this center and that it trains people for vocational skills, so I came here to learn. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I sad, I'm sad, and I miss my home. I do try to talk with my parents regularly, but it is difficult. The more I talk to them, the more my parents pity me, care for me, and try to share my sadness. When I was born, one of my legs was longer than the other. I was able to walk until the age of four, and then I started using crutches, and my health started to deteriorate. I'm full of distortions and mismatched in height. I don't think anyone wants to see my body. If our sculptures are seen in America, it's like us showing up for another audience to see. We have been living away, out of view. We will show them what we look like. And I am just kidding here, but maybe they will use my sculpture for shooting practice. I do feel a sense of sadness and misfortune, but I don't quite know how to express it. I, like Nia, also don't know quite how to express the sadness or explain those moments of joy that at times were present. The United States set forth to change the landscape of a country and in doing so altered the landscape of the human body for unknown generations. The core of my work is to bring to light the stories of ordinary people living under the extraordinary consequences of war. Individuals face the dichotomy of having bodies that are both private and social. Agent Orange connected disabilities and issues regarding compensation and responsibility are continually debated and contested publicly but at the same time have deeply personal implication for the victims. The intellectual and creative work of this project is an attempt to integrate these elements into a piece that avoids exploitation of individuals while engaging viewers and challenging them to make more profoundly informed and personal connections to the issue. Informing the project are questions about the collective consciousness of the emergence of deformed bodies, the moral and legal obligations owed to victims, and the change in collective worldviews caused by such a devastating consequences. Some in parts is a point of entry that allows the viewer the opportunity to look, to engage closely and intimately with bodies shaped by war in ways that are not afforded elsewhere. The cultural inclination is not to look, born from a sense of politeness or apprehension. With this work, the war body is placed into the public sphere and into the sculptural tradition, where it has largely been marginalized. The viewer is given the permission to look and for the subject the opportunity to be seen. The year following our time in Vietnam, Kirk and I traveled to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and documented through sculpture and photographs the mass amputations of arms and legs that occurred during the long and brutal Civil War. This upcoming year, we hope to create American Body, a series of full body molds of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. The closest I've come to understanding my particular draw to this work, I can best describe with a line from the American poet Louise Block. We looked at the world once in childhood. The rest is no matter. Uh, so that takes you through everyone that we worked with personally. Um, I do have a few more slides. 
Um, just to sort of talk about, you heard us mention to do hospital, you heard us mention uh, vocational centers and that kind of thing. So um, Vietnam, though capitalist, is still communist. Uh, so everything is run by the state. <clears throat> um, and there are places for people with issues concerning Agent Orange, uh, but there is no funding. Uh, so the country is very, very poor, and uh, there's, a, there's a great gap between the poor and the, and the wealthy in that country. Um, so this is, uh, this is Song. Uh, she was another person we casted, uh, and she was one of the most interesting, intelligent, and uh, articulate people that I felt like we worked with. Uh, she's an artist, she paints with her feet, uh, she also writes with her feet, um, she had an amazing sense of humor, and this is at that vocational center that we were talking about, which is just outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, a lot, all around the country, uh, there are these centers set up, and they train um, any sort of war wounded or anything to create trinkets and uh, enamel and what? That the inlay, the really popular Vietnamese inlay that you find on coffee tables and stuff, um, lacquer. They train these folks to make all this stuff for the tourist industry. Uh, so there's these huge centers that uh, are training people and then they move on to factory work. Uh, would you switch to the next slide? Uh, so this is some at the library at this center. Um, and there were all sorts of people there. I mean, it ranged from people you know, that had been in car accidents to people that had been born with Asian orange, uh, but it was just anyone with a disability. Um, we also visited quite a few orphanages while we were there. Uh, we were very fortunate enough to meet a young man uh, who was a contact through uh, one of Keisha's friends here in the States, uh, and he took us to where he was raised, which is called Govap Orphanage. Uh, in North Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, one of the biggest signs of Agent Orange, especially in infants and children, was uh, hydrocephalus, uh, enlargement of the head and water on the brain. Um, if it's not dealt with immediately when they're born, then there's no way to fix it. Um, and generally, these kids don't live past 10 years old. Uh, this was another orphanage just outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, one of the things that was most astounding to me while we were there was the breadth of how many people were affected by this. You know, I, when I, my understanding of Agent Orange was that it had, was something that had happened in the early 60s, you know, and, and that it wasn't, that generation had been affected, but it wasn't continuing on, and now it's in its fourth generation. Uh, so this is, uh, this is another orphanage, Tian Phet. Um, and the, one of the most important things about this image is the woman being cradled by the nurse there is 17 years old. So it's pretty unbelievable. Next. Uh, this is Tudu Hospital. It's the most famous place for victims of Agent Orange in the world, I would say. Um, it's a whole, there's a whole floor at Tudu Hospital that's devoted to diaps and victims. Uh, and other Vanity Fair did articles there, James Nockway shot there. There's been a lot of coverage of Tudu Hospital. Uh, so it's really protected. Uh, we were, uh, me as a photographer, I felt really fortunate that we kind of snuck in under the radar. We went once to have a meeting, and then I was taken upstairs to where all the kids were, and they let me shoot freely one time. Uh, and then we visited the hospital twice after that, and I wasn't allowed to shoot at all after that. So. Uh, I was just, the images that I caught at you were all from one visit. Um, next. Uh, this is at Govap Orphanage. Uh, the hydrocephalus can cause bed sores. Uh, so it's, since they're unable to move their bodies. Um, so uh, this room, too, was filled with, I would say, about 10 kids that all had the same, same infliction. Uh, this is at Chuyu Hospital. Uh, the little car, sort of against the rules of documentary, but we were bringing toys to some of the kids and stuff like that, um, and uh, the nurses in the background. Everyone there was really, really friendly. 
you know, and really helpful, but I think mostly because of the shadow of communism, they're really sort of afraid to give us any access to anything, um, just because it might offend someone who, who works above them, you know, so uh, this is, again, a, just one afternoon that we got to spend there. Uh, this is outside of Da Nang. Um, another big malady caused by Agent Orange is spina bifida. Uh, it's recognized by the Vietnam Veterans Association um, as, a, as being caused by Agent Orange. Um, and the craziest thing about Da Nang for me was we, we, our translators were, well, number one, we were working with a group called DAVA, the Da Nang Center for Agent Orange Victims. Uh, which was a wonderful organization. They also have a similar center that trains people and stuff. Um, but they, uh, they, gave, they let us ride with a few social workers, and they were also our translators, really, really nice gentlemen. Um, and around the, there had been a spill of Agent Orange at the Da Nang airport. Um, and we literally would leave one house that boarded the airport and go two blocks to another house that had a child that was inflicted with something, and then, you know, another half a mile down the road, there'd be another family that had the same thing. So, uh, it was just pretty wild, the, the, the extent of it all. Uh, this is also in Da Nang. Um, <clears throat> this might have been the saddest house I visited, uh, only because the mother said something that hit home really hard for me, where she just said, we're all poor, you know, all, of, all the Vietnamese are poor. And she said, you know, sometimes you can't afford to keep the people that can't work alive. So you have to choose who gets fed and, and where that comes from. Um, and she was speaking specifically about this kid. This is Tudu Hospital. Um, and same, what was really interesting to me about this young kid was he had the same maladies that Loy had. It was almost exactly the same. Like one very, you know, physically perfect arm and chest and everything, but then no legs and, and, and no hand. Uh, this, the, that last one's at the Da Nang Center for, uh, for Agent Orange. They uh, do an extensive training program with everyone. So there was a, they taught you embroidery and they taught you everything else. Um, and I thought we'd finish up the talk with just a few images of Vietnam, since we've sort of been talking about all this heavy stuff. Uh, it's an amazing country. It's a beautiful place. Everyone there, I never met an unfriendly person the entire time I was there. I was free to shoot anybody I wanted to. You know, people would hold up babies and have me take their picture, or, you know, invite me into their homes after I took their picture. It was really amazing. Um, and this is traffic in Ho Chi Minh City. This is like normal, everyday traffic. Next one. Uh, this is the Cao Yai. They're a religion just north of Vietnam, I mean just north of Ho Chi Minh City, uh, in their own little sort of province and world, the communist government sort of leaves them alone. Uh, and it's, it, it just speaks to the amazingness of the country. Uh, it's a religion that has Victor Hugo and Jesus Christ and other people as saints. So it's just a really amazing, amazing place. And it just, I, I don't know, there's just such a vibrant people. Uh, this is the landscape outside of Nha Trang, Vietnam. Again, just like, it's such a gorgeous country that it's hard to believe that such terrible atrocities happen there. Um, one of the big things about the Vietnamese too that I found so fascinating was the American War was the fourth land war that they fought in the last hundred years. So it's, and they've pushed out the opposition every time. You know, it was the Chinese, and then it was the French, and then it was the Russians, and then it was the Americans. Um, and every time they've, they've taken their country back. Uh, and I think this just, this is the last image, um, but I just think it speaks to like the industry and, and the beauty and everything of the people there. Um, squid drying in the sun, and everyone's working all the time, but everyone seems happy all the time. And uh, you always, I feel like when you hear about travel to Vietnam, it's always about food and that kind of thing, but it's just such a wonderful place and full of wonderful people. And, uh, it, you know, I, I just, 
I wish there was a way that more Americans could sort of learn what's happening there and just lend a hand from time to time. But I think that initially would be demo for us. Anyone has questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, you use the word hereditary and um, so, you know actually documented uh, a family that you talked about generations. I'm curious if there's an amplifying effect from residual toxins in the soil where these people live and, and the food that's grown in that soil as well. Yeah, um, yeah we kind of think of it uh, as two ways. One is the, you know, the, the genetic component that also is present in American, uh, in American veterans and their children. Um, the United States recognizes spina bifida and the children of Vietnam veterans as a service-connected disability. You definitely see a lot of that. As Kirk mentioned, in Da Nang, there's an eight-mile radius around the Da Nang airport where there was a giant spill. That is still in the land, and up until, I think it was like six years ago, people were still living and eating off that land, because dioxin is stored in the fatty tissues. So if you are eating like birds and fish and other wildlife, then you are ingesting high levels of dioxin from that area. So we did, that's why we saw so many people around that Deming Airport um, that were first time exposure to Agent Orange. And they've since, the Ford Foundation has since begun a clean up of that area. I have a question. Yeah. This is kind of a broad question, uh, and the answer may be obvious, but you've done this trip, and it's very personal, obviously, to your, your father and that experience, but you're also going to Sierra Leone, and you've, you've gone to Sierra Leone, and you've got this other project. Again, this may sound very naive, but what is it that you hope to accomplish through um, documentary sculpture and photography are you do you see yourselves as trying to shed light on the cost of war or um, or or understanding about disability or, or, or any number of things what's it might be, yeah it might be different for the two of us um, I think in some ways like doing this work I realize that I have a special access that is not available to everyone because I have a personal connection and I know that that definitely opened up a lot of people to me if I could say my father was a disabled American veteran my father was returned from the war in amputee and then died of a, in a cancer related to service in the Vietnam War Commander, not to, not to joke around about it but that is sort of like a, a big key for us <laughs> with the work we do is is talking about Keisha's father and Talking, my father was also a Vietnam veteran, so anytime that those things were raised, um, it was usually like, you know, if there was any hesitation, if that was raised, it, it sort of passed us through that hesitation. So, and it worked, it, it worked. I don't know. It's not a trick, but it was, it also, the same thing happened in, in Sierra Leone. It was sort of, you know, the minute Keisha would mention, well, I was raised by an amputee, that the folks there would just instantly sort of warm up to us. So it was just a, it was an easy way. One of the things that Keisha, when we first, when you first called me um, and you sent your, um, your, uh, what you had sort of sent for the grant, um, that it, the quote that we were taking the war body home, I think that was a big thing for me, was that idea of, of bringing these people back physically with us, you know, where, it, where they couldn't travel, they couldn't afford to travel or anything like that. It, the idea of, of bringing them home, I think was, well, or here to America, just to show the general public, I think that was a, yeah. a big driving force for me. I think creating an archive and documenting, you know, bodies that are shaped and altered by war, um, I don't know, I, I, think, I think that's what I'm trying to do, is to bring that war body and and put it into the, the sculptural tradition, because you do not see very often disabled bodies. No, and I will tell you that we've had some very visceral reactions to this. And people, it's, you know, it's distressing, but it's meant to be. Mm. It's meant to be, um, I mean, I assume. <laughs> That's my interpretation. Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I really do think it's an entry point into being able to look at these bodies in an intimate way. 
having the permission to do that. And I've always just been in love with still photography. I've been photographing since I was a kid. Um, and it, I think war is pretty easily glossed over by the media. Uh, one of the big things we encounter, where I, I feel like Vietnam is so grandiose and affected so many Americans that it is part of our idiom. You know, we, we know about the Vietnam War. They make movies about it and stuff. Uh, one of the big things that drew me or drove me in Sierra Leone was that no one knows about that war. And, you know, there was a really short period of time when the UN went in to sort of fix what was going on there that the media covered what was happening, but then they very quickly left um, and left a lot of people hanging. You know, there was a lot of people didn't really understand why the media had been there to begin with because nothing changed. You know, so I, I just feel like bringing those images back and, and reiterating that idea that this isn't over. You know, war is not, just because war happens and the media stops covering it, you know, next year we'll pull out of Afghanistan or whatever, according to Barack Obama, but, you know, that those people in that country are going to live with the after effects of what we've done for, for generations. So that's what's important to me. Um, it seems like the sculpture process seems such a, so complicated to me, and uh, and I know you would be very you, you need confidence in what you were doing that uh, that you wouldn't hurt people um, and that you knew what you were doing. I, could you talk a little bit about how you learned to do what you do? Sure. Um, when I first decided to do this project, I was not familiar with life casting. So I googled life casting, and it turned out two hours from my home in New Hampshire, in St. Albans, Vermont, lived Mark Print, who was considered um, the foremost authority on life casting. So I called him, um, I did many workshops with him, I brought Kirk in, we did workshops together, and um, usually the casting process is done in a very well, you know, lit, temperature controlled studio. The material like can cure within seven minutes. Um, in heat, you get maybe four minutes of working time. We worked in 95 degree heat with the full humidity and just kind of wherever we could grab a space. And that's why they are not full bodied um, casts because the people we're working with have. Um, you know, tax on their bodies to begin with. And at some points, the casting process took upwards of five hours. So we did what was possible. There's also modesty issues in Vietnam that we had to kind of work with. So we just, a lot of times, we were winging it. Yeah. Sierra Leone, <laughs> our drills, we, we were, like our drills comped out. We didn't yeah. have, there's no electricity for the most part in West, Af in West Africa. So we mixed everything, but Kirk mixed everything by hand um, for over 100 molds that we made. So it was an experiment. We were not sure if it was gonna work and we were not sure if the molds were good when we brought them home. And thankfully, the well, they yeah. were perfect. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. I mean, when she first quoted me what it was gonna cost for us to do this and get there and everything with no we had no contacts, we hadn't met anyone yet, you know, so it was, we were, we placed a lot of faith in just the idea that we yeah. could do this. Um, and Vietnam is interesting, because we showed up at the wrong time of year, so we, <laughs> we showed up just before Tet, uh, so it took about three weeks before we were even allowed to, not allowed, but even able to, yeah. to meet a contact, so uh, it was pretty high stress that way, and then, but then once things, started opening up for us it really it really changed so um in sierra leone it was different I, I think mostly because of the poverty level there people were um you know we would for your time that you spent with us we were giving very meager reparations of some rice and about 25 dollars american or something yeah, we tried for, to support as best we could the mbt camps when we were in sierra leone. yeah it was just, just because we realized that as people sat there waiting to be you know, molded, they were, they had not eaten the entire day. Yeah, and, so. and people were riding bikes miles to come meet us and you know, all this other stuff. So it was sort of a, a pretty intense situation there. Um, but in Vietnam, I mean, once we cut through the red tape, 
it sort of really started falling into place. So, yeah. um, we, um, do you know the work of Dwayne Hansen? Yep, yep, long time. Is this connected? In, we've had an exhibition of Dwayne yeah. Hansen here. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure exactly if he uses traditional life molding techniques. Um, I kind of think he might use a different technique. I see. Um, but yeah, excellent, wonderful, beautiful work. Yes. And, um, we kind of stuck with Forton MG, which is a traditional architectural material um, that a lot of body casters use. And it worked well for us. It picked up a lot of the dirt and oil um, from the skin, so that's why they're kind of discolored, which actually um, I fell in love with instead of just having a bone white cast. And considering that we were dealing with you know, an Asian population, trying to match skin color would have been really difficult. Um, so. I know when I looked at the works up close, you know, the details of the skin, uh, it's it's very, uh, it's almost eerie when you first look at them, because you're going to, God, yeah. it's just so real. I think Lopes is the most interesting for me, because he was a, training as a bricklayer when we met him, um, right in the little vocational center we met him in. So when you look in the creases of his hands and feet, there's actually the dirt from what he was working with that day. So oh. it's pretty amazing. And there are methods where you can kind of do like laser scans, but I, I don't really like that method because you don't pick up all the little pores and scars that you would if you do traditional technique. You've uh, pulled the screen back um, for people to take a look um, and, and see some of what's happening. And in a sense, you're not bringing the bodies home, they are home. <laughs> And uh, the interlopers were the people from the United States. And I wonder if um, the screen was pulled back at all and you began to reflect about a society that could inflict this, even though it was being taught from the very beginning about the toxicity of this, and continue on with it with almost no remorse. Yeah. Uh, it's it makes me furious. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, it's definitely something that was, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I, in Hanoi, I met with many physicians and scientists, um, and one of them said something to me that really resonated and stuck with me all these years. If the people of America could uprise and protest the, the way that the Vietnamese are being treated and how Asian orange victims are not being cared for, in the same way that we saw the youth movement during the war and protests against the war, then a real difference maybe could be made. To say nothing about uh, the war is the same uh, process that continues. I mean, people will be doing this for Iraq mm -hmm. and Afghanistan, and Somalia, etc. Uh, one of the big things for me while I was there too was meeting veterans that had moved back to Vietnam, yeah. um, which is an amazing phenomenon, I think. There's thousands of, of people yeah. that have moved back to that country after being in war in the country. Um, some of them, I think, felt like they had to apologize in some way and that moving to Vietnam was the way to do it. Others fell in love, others you know, fell in love with the country or fell in love with women there or fell in love with you know, anything, but um, I was fortunate I, I got to stay with a man who is afflicted with uh, Agent Orange poisoning. He was a medic during the war. Uh, he lives in the Trang now, and he does a really wonderful thing called the, the, the Orange Walk every year. Um, and the first time they walked, so, so, yeah, I think Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, um, so wow. a full thousand miles. Yeah. Um, and then the following year they took motorbikes and went into Laos. I mean, that's another huge thing that Americans really are in the dark about is this, the war took place in Laos and Cambodia as well. Absolutely. Uh, and Agent Orange was used considerably over there as well. He, um, the Van family, he was stationed in Cambodia, or his father was on the Cambodian side um, and was affected by it. So I think that's, you know, the, the land war in those countries are also something that here, you know, almost no one knows anything about, um, but, yeah, it's 
it's it's it's it's hard to come home and <laughs> from this. Some you know, there's just times where it's you know, knowing that Monsanto knew that this was going on is is hard to live with, but <laughs> and infuriating. <laughs> Any more questions? Thanks so much for coming out. Yeah, thanks very much. You were great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.